Just as Grendel represented the antithesis of the Thane and his mother the antithesis of the Peace Weaver, so the dragon is the antithesis of the ring-giving king. The dragon hoards gold selfishly and for no purpose other than to increase the size of its hoard. It violently defends its gold against any who come near, eager to battle any who threaten him in his greed. The ring-giver lavishes treasure eagerly on his thanes in recognition of their loyalty and bravery. He is generous and kind, eager to establish a lasting peace for his people. The danger that faces every king is the danger of becoming dragonish inside, of using your thanes to increase your gold hoard instead of using your gold hoard to increase the security of your people. Heramod was one king who fell to this temptation. His tale was told earlier by Ashope and by Hrothgar. Thorin Oakenshield nearly falls to this temptation as well in The Hobbit, a story which you've probably figured out by now that was heavily influenced by Tolkien's knowledge of and love for Beowulf. When the Yates gaze upon the body of their king and see the dragon and treasure, the poet takes great pains to explain that Beowulf did not fall prey to gold lust. We learn in line 3052 that the treasure was under a spell, which meant no one was ever permitted to enter the ring hall unless God himself, mankind's keeper, true king of triumphs, allowed some person pleasing to him and his eyes were, and in his eyes worthy to open the hoard. This means that according to the poet, Beowulf was able to defeat the dragon because God was pleased with him. God thought Beowulf worthy to receive the gold. A few lines later, the poet repeats that Beowulf's gaze at the gold treasure when he first saw it had not been selfish. The king sought the treasure for the sake of his people, and the poet confirms the purity of his intentions. The poet takes such care to explain Beowulf's motives because the Yates misinterpret them. Even Wiglaf questions the wisdom of Beowulf's desire to fight the dragon. He says, Often when one man follows his own will, many are hurt. This happened to us. Nothing we advised could ever convince the prince we loved, our land's guardian, not to vex the custodian of the gold. The Yates think that Beowulf fought the dragon in order to acquire the gold. They suspect that he acted out of greed, giving in at the very end of his life to pride. Many critics have agreed with Wiglaf's assessment of Beowulf's motives, but I think this is a misreading. The poet makes it clear that Beowulf fought the dragon in order to destroy a serious threat to his people and to secure the gold for his people's good. Furthermore, we must remember that Wiglaf had known only peace his entire life. He doesn't know what it means to live under the tyranny of a monster as the Danes learned from Grendel. Beowulf knows that if he does not kill the dragon and secure the gold hoard, some other yate will try to do so and only awaken the dragon's wrath and devastating fire once again. The poet tells us exactly how we are to understand Beowulf's motives, as those of the greatest of all ring-givers. Then Wiglaf gives orders for Beowulf's pyre and funeral, or more accurately, his first funeral. They pitch the dragon's body over the cliff, load all the gold onto a cart, and carry Beowulf's body to Hronesnes. There they build the king's pyre, and kindled the hugest of all funeral flames. Fumes of wood smoke billowed darkly up. The blaze roared and drowned out their weeping. Wind died down, and flames wrought havoc in the hot bone house, burning it to the core. A Yate woman gives voice to the nation's grief, singing out prophetically, and unburdened herself of her worst fears. A wild litany of nightmare and lament, her nation invaded, enemies on the rampage, bodies in piles, slavery and abasement. Heaven swallowed the smoke. When the fire is burned out, the Yates construct a barrow, a mound of earth over Beowulf's remains. This takes them ten days. But then, after ten days, the Yates decide to bury the treasure as well. They buried torques in the barrow and jewels, and a trove of such things as trespassing men had once dared to drag from the hoard. They let the ground keep that ancestral treasure, gold under gravel, gone to earth, as useless to men now as it ever was. Twelve warriors then ride around Beowulf's tomb, chanting dirges and praises for Beowulf's greatness. They conclude by declaring in a formulaic phrase that, that occurs in special instances in Germanic legend, 
that of, and they say this about Beowulf, that of all the kings upon earth, he was the man most gracious and fair-minded, kindest to his people and keenest to win fame. While all of this seems to be part of a single mournful funeral for a great Yiddish king, many scholars argue that there are actually two separate ceremonies here. The first ceremony involves the burning of Beowulf's body and armor, the woman's song of lament, and the building of the mound. This is the typical ceremony given as memorial for a dead king. This is the same ceremony we saw in the Finsburg fragment, grieving comrades, a lamenting woman, and flames consuming the corpse and battle gear. But when the mound is finished, they begin a completely new set of ceremonies that Beowulf did not request. They construct a wall devised by exceedingly wise people, the original Anglo-Saxon says. Heaney translates it as, as worthy of him as their workmanship could make it. They bury the treasure in the wall, then ride around it shouting praises of their fallen king. They conclude with a very formulaic de- declaration of Beowulf as most gracious and fair-minded. This second set of ceremonies appear in different places in Germanic mythology and history as a, as a pagan ritual called Manweorthenga, or the worship of human beings, hero worship. What we see in the second ceremony is the Yates attempt to turn Beowulf into a god by pleading his case to the pagan pantheon. Writing about this second funeral, Beowulf scholar Frank Robinson writes that the Yates are so overawed by their fallen leader's accomplishments and so unwilling to accept the finality of his death that they turn desperately to the pagan resources available to them to accord him ultimate veneration and perhaps recruit his protective force beyond the grave. So overwhelmed by the by the horror of their very likely future, they resort to Manweorthinga, a pagan ritual to, to apotheosize, to deify Beowulf so that he can provide his protection to them even after he's dead. So why would a Christian poet end his poem with a pagan ceremony, an attempt to deify Beowulf? Robinson argues that the second ceremony would drive home to the poet's audience the culmination of the tension between the inspiring heroism of their ancestors— the heroism of Beowulf, and the sad darkness of the reality of their heathenism. Robinson writes, The poet's moving depiction of the solemn ritual around Beowulf's tomb is his last melancholy admiring gaze back on a man so great that people would think him a god, on a people so benighted that they thought a man might become a god. And ultimately, I would suggest, the poet seeks to point his audience to a god who became a man, a greater Beowulf named Jesus of Nazareth. 